again, it's my pleasure to uh, sort of uh, conclude the, the um, morning symposium today. And it, what I'd like to tell you about is some of our efforts, um, and, and I sort of colloquially call it using old for new, um, to Im imply that what we're going to be looking at is, is a juvenile disease, so not, not so much on the um, sort of adult onset side of, of uh, the um, uh, spectrum, but to look at some, uh, a disease called muscular dystrophy. It's a neuro, um, uh, the most prevalent neuromuscular de uh, degenerative disease out there. Um, it's involved in one in sort of every 3,600 live male births in the United States. Um, it has a very um, robust advocacy group, so uh, one of the nice things about these patients, and, and also one of the tragic things, is that um, this nonsense mutation in a gene called dystrophin um, can be sort of overcome by a variety of different um, processes within muscle, either its own endogenous regeneration with uh, satellite cells, uh, compensation from proteins like eutrophin, uh, and what that um, eventually leads to is uh, patients that succumb to the disease, say, in the third life, third decade of life. So um, it, it can be a very tragic situation where you've, you've got patients that sort of have a, a clock, if you will, and, and so we're trying to get a variety of therapies into those, those patients. And one of the biggest problems with this disease is that it affects this protein dystrophin that's 2.2 megabases. It has almost 80 different exons in it, so it makes it very difficult with all this splicing that goes on to be actually able to sort of target um, any good region of the protein and understand its function or to do any sort of, of gene therapy with it. And it, despite the fact that we know that, that most of the common mutations that occur in this um, protein end up altering the uh, ability then to link together the actin cytoskeleton, sort of the business end of muscle, with the outside world in the extracellular matrix. And so we're, we're sort of deleting the um, c ternal part of the uh, protein dystrophin and altering its ability then to transduce forces. So um, sort of as a side effect, if you will, of this disease is the fact that um, you get sort of uh, significant fibrosis and muscle stiffening. So as, as shown in the lower left here, um, these are two different studies then indicating that uh, you have altered sort of mechanical function of the muscle itself, and that's due to a variety of different um, uh, reasons, one being the excess deposition of extracellular matrix proteins like collagens um, in this muscle. And so you can see sort of um, the uh, collagen one that's, that gets deposited in between um, these muscle fibers, and that, that uh, eventually then stiffens the muscle and causes it to uh, degenerate um, and, and lose its function. Now, there are a variety of different um, clinical outcomes that people have, have looked at, but the gold standard by the FDA is the six-minute walk, uh, walking distance test. And so the uh, data shown at the right is uh, just sort of a comparison then of, of um, normal patients then um, where you and I can say walk about uh, 500 meters or so in, in six minutes. Um, patients that are sort of high functioning muscular dystrophy patients um, don't necessarily have that sort of uh, change as a function of um, early progression of the disease, but, but once there's a severe onset, um, uh, patients really begin to fail. So a, a variety of um, clinical trials then have been targeted at trying to sustain this population for as long as possible. Um, but most of these treatments then uh, simply go into managing or maintaining um, muscle function and are really not uh, focused in on regeneration. I, I mentioned this uh, idea of, of exon skipping, sort of um, trying to uh, jump over where the, the um, mutation is um, or trying to boost uh, dystrophin. But the thing that I'd like to point out is, is uh, unfortunately, thanks to the government shutdown, we're not, uh, we don't have the most accurate numbers. But, but right now, there really are no cell-based approaches to um, thinking about muscular dystrophy. So um, what I'd first like to present then is, is our um, data then looking at adult mesenchymal stem cells. So these are cells that have been characterized um, by the uh, company Osiris Therapeutics back in the late 1990s. And the idea is that, that these uh, have a distinct surface marker population that come out of the um, bone marrow, not hematopoietic, but, but in fact a, a slightly different niche and they have the ability to go down a variety of different um, mesodermal lineages. Now, all these cells live in the context of a three-dimensional extracellular environment. Um, what I'd like to tell you about then is, is our ability to control these cells by the extracellular matrix and its intrinsic properties, which are many. 
So you can have matrix ligands, uh, so differences in the composition, differences in the stiffness. So thinking about something that's as, as hard as that or something that's way too soft. So um, my jokes aren't nearly as good as Larry's. Um, but our first attempt to understand how these cells sort of interact with their microenvironment and how that environment can in part play uh, a role in their differentiation was to look at these cells uh, under uh, conditions where they're, they're attached to a gel that has a defined set of matrix properties like stiffness so we can make things hard or soft. And the take home message was just that these cells could then differentiate or at least become sort of the precursor cells to each one of these different lineages based off of the uh, mechanical properties that we are presenting this, to the cell. So bone relatively stiff, muscle sort of in between, um, uh, fat and neurons then slightly softer. So from a regenerative perspective, wanting to get these cells um, and their ability to differentiate down a specific lineage, so, so we want to take cells as far as we can down this myogenic lineage. Um, there are a variety of other cell types out there that are perhaps um, superior then to these bone marrow derived stem cells where we had done proof of concept work. And so I, I'd first point to the work of Amy Wager's lab um, <clears throat> at Harvard where they showed that these, um, uh, what are called skeletal muscle progenitor cells, you can think of them as a satellite cell, were helping to regenerate muscle and you could actually see some functional recovery. And um, from the work of Helen Blau's lab, we showed that, that these uh, skeletal muscle progenitor cells could in fact be expanded in culture, but we wanted to take the position where um, we could look at adipose drive stem cells. So this is a, a healthy sort of donor population. We're going to restrict it to female donors that are um, relatively young, so 20 to, 30 year, uh, 20 to 40 years old, uh, and look at their adipose uh, derived stem cells and see do they have the same capabilities as these cells to differentiate, to engraft into tissues, and ultimately to regenerate function. Um, and again, the, the sort of um, reason why we'd be most interested in these cells is because they have the advantage over, say, a bone marrow derived stem cell or an SMP that we can get these um, from a rapidly um, enlarging population, if you will, so we're growing ever obese. And in Southern California, we like to say, well, people can be somewhat vain, so they like to get rid of their fat. So it's sort of the, the best of both worlds, if you will. So um, as I mentioned, these adipose derived stem cells had a property that was slightly different from the bone marrow derived stem cells that we were working with, and that is the um, observation that they will, in fact, fuse together in culture. So if you drop the serum concentrations and play a few other tricks, you can get these cells to fuse together. The problem was that, that myoblast fusion um, is a relatively rare event in, with these adipose derived stem cells when you're simply differentiating them by chemical means. So what uh, Yusuf Choi did in the lab was to look at these um, adipose derived stem cells where he differentially labeled them uh, either populations of, of green labeled cells or red labeled cells using a membrane dye and he mixed those two together and he noticed that if you do this with a bone marrow derived stem cell um, the red cell stays red, the green cell stays green even if they're touching each other. Um, that isn't the case with a control myoblast population or with our adipose derived stem cells. So we got multinucleated cells that were yellow. Now, this was an indication that perhaps fusion occurred, but it wasn't definitive evidence, and so what we did to prove that was to look at the population, make sure that they are chi-67 negative, so they're not proliferating um, at the moment that we look at these cells, but they have a continuous cytoskeletal network between um, these multinucleated um, cells. And most importantly, what we could do then is to trypsonize these cells and replate them into an environment that looked sort of dystrophic from the perspective of the extracellular matrix. So we could change um, stiffness, let's say, and, and make it look much more um, like the dystrophic fibrotic muscle that I was mentioning earlier. And we noted that the fusion rates of these cells didn't really change. But there was one important caveat to this, and I'd sort of say it's like the inverse Wall Street problem, that we care about this really rare, or not as rare, population of, of cells now, that about 2% fusion as opposed to 0.2%. Um, but we, we don't really like this 98% of the population that seems to transdifferentiate when we put them into these more osteogenic-like matrices. Um, they become RUNCs2 positive, and that's absolutely what we don't want. So we want to get rid of those cells. So there are three um, really large sort of um, blocks, if you will, for us going forward to actually translate these cells into a, a therapy. And the first one, is, I'd like to touch on the first two today, and that would be that are all adipose drive stem cells equal? So uh, we can get them from, say, visceral regions like um, with liposuction, as we were previously doing. We could also get them from a variety of other locations within the body. Um, and we want to know whether or not those are all the same. Um, 
we want to address issues of, say, um, plasticity as well. So are these cells um, going to transdifferentiate? Because that's really important in uh, moving forward with any of these therapies. And so here's the aging pitch. So we were interested at first in relatively young donors. But um, a, a series of collaborations that we've had with Sam Ward and John Lane here at UCSD um, in orthopedics has interest, interest us in the supraspinatus and infraspinatus muscles of the rotator cuff. And the reason for this is, is because rotator cuffs are commonly torn, so people go in and get revision surgeries to reattach the, the muscle or the tendon. Um, and so we can look at these different MRI images and we can figure out exactly how diseased that patient is. And so what you're, you're noting here is this is the supraspinatus and infraspinatus muscles. And what I'm, I'm pointing to with the blue arrow here is epimuscular fat. So this is fat that's now developed on top of the muscle itself. Um, and if we were to take fat either from this region or from the, the subcutaneous sort of back fat, if you will, um, or from um, liposuctions with younger patients, uh, what we notice is that there are dramatically different cell morphologies from these, even though they're all adipose-derived stem cells, they express the same markers that you would expect them to. Um, they double at dramatically different rates, and, and so they've got a lot of different properties about them. Most notably, they seem to have um, dramatically different origins, even though they're still fat. So there are sort of three different types of fat, um, white fat, brown fat, and a more recently characterized um, cell, pa uh, cell paper uh, pointed us to this idea of beige fat. So a uh, fat that is sort of somewhat metabolically active, um, but yet has, uh, is not necessarily um, from a muscle-like lineage as is brown fat. And so as we induce these cells um, from a variety of different patients, either from our abdominal patients, um, from the back fat, or from the rotator cuff epimuscular fat, um, we notice a dramatically different lineage. So I'd, I'd point your attention then to um, here, where we're looking at sort of generic fat markers, um, as well as then our epimuscular fat from patients that had no tear. So these are sort of normal um, rotator cuffs. Uh, maybe they had some bursitis, but that was about it. And so when they came into the clinic and we, we got their biopsies, then we noticed that they were preferentially becoming brown fat. Whereas if we took um, these cells from the torn cases, then they were preferentially becoming beige. And so that was an interesting observation to us, but what was more important was the fact that regardless of, of that tear state, there is a significant increase in the myogenic capacity of these cells, beyond what we ever found with our um, uh, liposuction samples. So older patients, even though they're older, um, because we've taken them from the specific abdominal uh, anatomical region that we are interested in, now are differentiating um, very robustly, and they're capable of fusion in co-culture. So this is a co-culture with C2C12 cells, um, or with uh, patient match cells, and the take home message is that um, either you're looking at these green cells in, in panel A or in, in D, you're looking at the acquisition then of this red signal, and you're getting fusion of these cells at a much higher rate when we're looking at the epimuscular fat in an aged population versus just say a visceral fat population in an older, um, in, a, in a younger population. But we come back to this idea that transdifferentiation of these cells is really a, a big problem for us. And so what's also been noted um, by Justin Cooper White's lab uh, in Queensland is the fact that these cells integrate a variety of cues together, both from the matrix as well as from uh, the media and, and, and growth factor signaling. So what you're looking at here then um, are two uh, cells that are grown on a variety of different matrix stiffnesses, if you will. So um, we're interested sort of in this middle region again around nine. And we're seeing the induction then of myOD, um, a muscle transcription factor, on collagen one coated and fibronectin coated uh, matrices, whereas if you're using laminin 111 or collagen four, we're not necessarily getting robust differentiation of these cells. And that's interesting from the perspective of what normal muscle makes. So uh, this is uh, mass spec data from um, our lab where we're looking at the expression of um, proteins in red here that are, are matrix proteins primarily associated with the disease state. Um, <clears throat> with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, whereas the, the green proteins down here are primarily expressed then um, in healthy muscle. And what you'll notice is that things like collagen 4 and laminin um, are preferentially expressed in normal muscle, whereas decorin, a, cro a collagen cross-linking protein, and collagen 6s um, are expressed in the dystrophic case. And so we can confirm this with Alessandro Sacco's lab and, and show that um, this is in fact um, what we observe. So we want to, to better differentiate these cells 
using a much more complete environment. We also want to select these cells against um, those hyperproliferative cells. So we can use a drug called RSC and we can get rid of um, some of those singly nucleated um, muscle fibers. Uh, sing singly nucleated muscle cells, I should say. So when we're interested in injecting these cells um, into um, an animal model then of, of say muscular dystrophy, the first thing that we wanted to do is just make sure that they could engraft and actually form um, functioning muscle and, and make human dystrophin. And so we did the injections then um, into a, a TA muscle, so it's one of the hind limb muscles. And the take home message is that you can get these cells to engraft, they can express human dystrophin despite um, being in older or younger patients or, or older or younger cells, we can get these cells to engraft, make human dystrophin, um, and we're still doing all the functional recovery assays to see whether or not um, these cells, these uh, mice then are indeed um, more ambulatory because we've now rescued their expression of dystrophin with the appropriately full length um, version of human dystrophin. So just to uh, conclude then, uh, what I'd really like to point out then uh, is the fact that these ASCs can fuse at higher rates when we're looking at matrix properties, but ultimately we need to put um, all these different stimuli together so that we can ensure that these cells fuse and are no longer plastic, um, especially if we're taking them from, uh, say, a rotator cuff where these cells, given their origin um, and where they're sort of living in the body, are bathed in these muscle factors and are, are very myogenic. And so ultimately we want to use these cells to engraft in these mouse models and show functional recovery. So I'd just like to thank those that, that helped do all this work. Um, primarily um, all those highlighted in blue here. So Yusuk Choi is a postdoc uh, who's now an assistant professor at the University of Sydney, as well as Gretchen Mayer, a postdoc who will be um, leaving us very shortly for her own lab uh, at Washington University. Uh, as well as our collaborators, Merrick Dobb, he gets us all of our um, uh, uh, liposuction samples, so he loves dealing with um, fat uh, and making people skinny. Uh, Sam Ward and uh, John Lane then got us all of our rotator cuff samples, as well as uh, lots of help from Alessandra's lab, as well as funding then from the um, uh, San Diego Skeletal Muscle Center, uh, Muscular Dystrophy Association, and a new investigator award, new innovator award from NIH. So, thank you very much. <laughs>